intellect. Ushers and sidesmen, just before we begin the service, there is more space to the southern door. Southern door, there's more space for sitting. Please, can you just come and confirm and bring in more people there uh, to sit? Just come and check so that we bring in people to sit. May we stand, may we stand as we usher in um, His Excellency the President. We most graciously welcome you, Your Excellency, to All Saints Cathedral Centenary Celebrations, 100 years since the cathedral was started. Most welcome. Thank you, Your Grace, as you welcome the President. Thank you. We may now sit. The service will be starting shortly. Procession will be beginning in the next couple of minutes. We also welcome uh, the Chief Justice. We welcome you warmly. We also acknowledge the presence of the President of the Court of Appeal. Uh, we welcome you, Justice Kihara Kariuki. Most welcome.
Lead us to the west door. No, 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 no. No, we're still waiting for the west door. Come. But it's a procession now. Let's be in a solemn moment. Drums. Just be ready. As the procession begins. We have three processions. That will be the first. We will guide you. Um,
The church is one foundation. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let's join together in a moment of praise and worship. Hallelujah. All right. Moyo wangu sifu bana sifu bana siku zote. Hallelujah. Imba, imba, imba. Anaweza, anaweza, anaweza. Tum 
Even as we continue, we're going to sing a song that says, Hide me now, Lord, under your wings, and cover me within your mighty hands. That we are celebrating a hundred years of God's faithfulness, that he will continue covering us, and he will continue going forth with us from this day forward. Amen.
that the Lord your God is God. He is a faithful God, keeping his covenant of love to a thousand generations of those who love him and keep his commandments. In the name of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Amen. we are gathered here to celebrate God's faithfulness to us and to thank him for the ministry throughout the last 100 years. Give thanks to the Lord for his faithfulness endures forever.
The Lord be with you. Look to the rock from which you are cut, and to the quarry from which you are hewn. The earth is the Lord's and all that is in it. the Lord. I was glad when they said to me, praise the Lord. May this church continue to make more saints. We kneel for the prayer of purity. Together, Almighty God, you bring to light things hidden in darkness and know the shadows of our hearts. Cleanse and renew us by your spirit that we may walk in the light and glorify your name through Jesus Christ, the light of the world. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ said, If you love me, keep my commandments. Blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. Hear, therefore, what God has commanded his people. I am the Lord your God. You shall have no other gods but me. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. Amen. Amen. Lord, have mercy and give us grace to keep this law. You shall not make yourself any idol. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Amen. Amen. Lord, have mercy and give us grace to keep this law. You shall not dishonor the name of the Lord your God. You shall worship him with awe and reverence. Amen. Amen. Lord, have mercy and give us grace to keep this law. Remember the Lord's day and keep it holy. Christ is risen from the dead. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. Amen. Lord, have mercy and give us grace to keep this law. Honor your father and your mother. If anyone does not provide for his relatives, especially he for his own family. He has disowned the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Amen. Lord, have mercy and give us grace to keep this law. You shall not commit murder. Everyone who is angry with his brother shall be liable to judgment. Amen. Lord, have mercy and give us grace to keep this law. You shall not commit adultery. Anyone who looks at another lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Amen. Lord, have mercy and give us grace to keep this law. You shall not steal. Let the thief labor, doing honest work with his hands, so that he may be able to give to those in need. Amen. Lord, have mercy and give us grace to keep this law. You shall not bear false witness. Let, Let everyone, everyone speak the truth. Amen. Lord, have mercy and give us grace to keep this law. You shall not covet anything which belongs to your neighbor. It is more blessed to give than to receive. Love your neighbor as yourself, for love is the fulfilling of the law. Amen. Lord, have mercy and write these laws in our hearts, we pray. May we all stand up.
Your word, O life, of life, O God, was announced for the first time in this church, named after all the saints, 100 years ago. The word called on the people then to proclaim the saving message of Christ. We thank you, God, for the faithful who were dedicated and who we pray that we emulate. We pray that we may draw strength from them and continue announcing the saving message in season and out of season. Lest we forget, we pray for the Holy Spirit to make those who will a hundred years after us still continue to proclaim the same saving message of Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our Old Testament is reading is taken from Deuteronomy chapter 4, verses 1 to 9. Deuteronomy chapter 4, 1 to 9. Hear now, O Israel, the decrees and laws I'm about to, to teach you. Follow them so that you may live and may go in and take possession of the land that the Lord, the God of your fathers, is giving you. Do not add to what I command you, and do not subtract from it, but keep the commands of the Lord your God that I give you. You saw with your own eyes what the Lord did at Bathpil. The Lord your God destroyed from among you everyone who followed the bar of Pew, but all of you who held fast to the Lord your God are still alive today. See, I have taught you decrees and laws as the Lord my God commanded me, so that you may follow them in the land you are entering to take possession of it. Observe them carefully, for this will show you, will show your wisdom and understanding to the nations who will hear about all these decrees and law and, and say, surely this is great nation is wise and understanding people. What other nation is so great as to have their gods near them? the way the Lord our God is near us whenever we pray to him. And what other nation is so great as to have such righteous decrees and laws, the, uh, this board of laws I'm setting before you today. Only be careful and watch yourselves closely so that you do not forget the things your eyes have seen or let them sleep from your heart as long as you live. Teach them to your children and to their children after them. This is the word of the Lord.
epistle reading comes from the book of Ephesians chapter 2, beginning from verse 11. Ephesians chapter 2, beginning from verse 11. Therefore, remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision, which is done in the body by human hands, remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel, and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. This is the word of the Lord. And now we stand to hear the good news of our salvation. As it is written in the gospel according to St. Matthew chapter 5, beginning to read at verse 13. You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled by men. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Never do people light a lamp and put it under the bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. This is the gospel of Christ.
Lord our God, you speak to us through your word. Despite speaker, despite thoughts, may your spirit open our hearts to hear what you're saying to us, to set our lives afar afresh with love for you, and to send us out obedient. In Jesus' name, amen. Please do be seated. Your Excellency, Your Grace, the Archbishop, my Lords, the Bishops, all guests of great honor, all loved by the Lord, sisters and brothers in Christ, thank you for this enormous privilege of speaking to you today on this centenary. 23 years ago, I wandered into this cathedral during my seven months in Kenya in 1974 at a Harambe school up near Kiburu, or in Kiburu, near Garadina. And on a day off in Nairobi, I wandered in and looked around knowing nothing of it. I was 18. But it was in those seven months not here, sadly, but in the mud-walled church at Kiburu that I first saw the reality of Christian life and that the Lord Jesus began to get his hand on me. So it is to Kenya that I owe my own conversion and under Christ my salvation. Thus, to speak today to you is such a privilege. This building has existed for a hundred years and it has gathered memories. Cathedrals are places of memory, of promise and hope. Think of the history that has gone through and around this building. It was built in the early years of the colonial regime and stood above and watched the demonstrations for independence and heard the prayers during the violence of the emergency as a nation called for independence, for freedom, and for the right to choose its own future. It was there for the celebrations of that independence, for the prayers and the services, in this building, prayers have been said for freedom, for democracy, and for hope. It saw the first time a Kenyan was enthroned as Archbishop. Under the great Archbishop Gatari, it witnessed bloodshed and violence as the police attacked those seeking a new and democratic Kenya. They pursued demonstrators in here and not finding their main target, attacked others so savagely that the cathedral was closed for a week while there was cleansing both physical and spiritual. Some of the tear gas cylinders are still kept here. The cathedral has been a quiet place for prayer for visitors with heavy burdens, for young men wondering whether God existed for joyful celebration of a country growing in hope. And today it looks forward with its plans for its children to be educated in following Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. It looks back, it witnesses to the present day. It is a sign of the faithfulness of God to the Kenya that is not yet known but is the dream of its people. As a place of memories and hopes and of praise, it is part of the family of great cathedrals worldwide. For cathedrals come often to tell a story of their communities, of their nations. I wear a cross of nails that comes from the Cathedral of Coventry in the UK. 
In November 1940, that cathedral, built in the 14th century, was bombed during World War II. The city and the cathedral burned, and the casualties were terrible. Six weeks later, the provost, speaking on Christmas Day 1940 on the BBC, spoke of the hope of a world after war, a more Christ-like world, he said. And from the end of the war, Coventry Cathedral, still in ruins, became a center of reconciliation. And those who worked there, as I did for five years, wore a cross made from the nails that had fallen from the medieval beams of the old cathedral as they burned. In 1962, the, building, the rebuilding was complete. The new cathedral linked to the old, a sign of death and resurrection. It tells a story to this day. It speaks of the horror of war, of the cost of reconciliation, of the hope of peace in Christ, as does this one. They are powerful buildings. In Coventry, I've seen hardened police officers, not even Christians, weep as they looked at the building and saw in its shapes and signs the symbol of all that was important to them in life. And more than that, the offer of reconciliation from Christ. Canterbury Cathedral, my own cathedral now, built in the 1100s, has a place where its then Archbishop Thomas was murdered in 1171, one of five of my 104 predecessors to be murdered. So far, we've avoided it under this one. <laughs> there was one of my children who is mathematically inclined said to me in a cheerful mood, Dad, do you realize we're 165 years overdue for the next archbishop to be assassinated? <laughs> Children are wonderful. But each year on the anniversary of that murder, whoever is archbishop stands on the very stone where Thomas was killed as the words that were said at the time of the killing, shouted by the murderers, cried out by the monks in desperation, as those words are repeated and the story is told. It is an emotional moment, but it is a symbol of the call for church leaders to be faithful to Christ first. Even when, as with Thomas, as with Christians in many other countries today, other countries than this or the UK, they face the power of tyranny. Uganda tells the same story every year of a mo modern martyr, Archbishop Janani Lewum. Some people might argue that a museum tells a story and in Europe, you do find cathedrals that feel like museums, simply places that speak of a spiritual life long since gone from the place. But what is different about these great buildings, this great building, cathedrals? First, it is that they do not speak of human beings alone, only of history but of human beings who love and are loved by God. The difference is everything. When I came to Kenya for the first time, I saw and met human beings that were like so many other human beings in most respects. They had houses, families, farms, cattle. Far more than that though, the East African revival had touched their lives and they lived with Christ as an ever-present reality. To witness to history is important, but to witness to God at work in history is to make a statement that is far more important. It is to say that what we see is not all there is, that times of trouble and fear are not random, nor are they beyond the control of God. 
in the first reading from Deuteronomy, the theme was, do not forget. Moses says, for what other great nation has a God so near to it as the Lord our God is whenever we call to him? The people of Israel were not just to remember that they were a great nation because they were not a great nation. Elsewhere in Deuteronomy, God says he did not choose them in chapter 7 as he does not choose each of us because we are important. God doesn't care tuppence how important or unimportant we are, but he chose them because he loved them. They are told to remember that God is close to them and they have his law. We repeated that law earlier in the service. In other words, they are to rem remember they are in relationship with God. Do not forget. This building says that to Kenya, to all who pass by it, to all who enter it. Kenya is a great nation and the building is a great building. But it is not remembering, it is not saying, remember you are a great nation, for why else would you have a great cathedral? It is saying, remember God. The Israelites in the desert remembered that God had brought them freedom. It had been a struggle, but they remembered that it was because of God that freedom had come. This building reminds us that Kenya is free, can argue, is able to disagree, go to court, demonstrate, cheer its rulers or criticize them because freedom is the gift of God. When we forget that all we have comes from God, then we also forget all constraints and we act as though God does not exist. We become proud because we begin to imagine that what we see around us is of our own making. Moses was calling the people to action in obedience to the law God gave them. The law was the sign of their relationship with God as the gift of the Holy Spirit to the church and to each believer is the sign and seal of our relationship with God. They had to live within the law to love their neighbor across all the 12 tribes of Israel to pursue justice, to care for the poor, to worship in truth, to turn from all other gods, to be faithful, never to steal, never to bear false witness, never to covet, never to kill. They were the signs of being the people of God. They were to be different. Kenya has beauty in its lands, rich farming, wise people, a great history. It found freedom and reconciliation after the emergency. It is at the heart of the great East African revival. It has received hope and strength and a people who are an example in Africa. These things are the gift of God. And the building to us says to us, remember the scriptures, and do not forget, be different. Cathedrals tell another story as well. They say, remember not only that you are a people, but more than that, you are a people in relationship with Jesus who have been changed. The second reading from Ephesians speaks of the change that Paul was telling the church in Ephesus to remember. He says in verses 12 and 13, remember that you were at that time without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Do you hear that key word again? Remember. What an amazing God we serve. He knows what is right. 
When, as human beings, we cannot keep the rules, our temptation is to ignore them or make them easier. But God does not make the rules easier. He makes the people new. You and I are new people if Jesus is our Savior. We were far away from God, but he has brought us near. We were bankrupt in spirit, not just poor, bankrupt. And he has made us rich and full of the Spirit of God. We had no hope of heaven and no knowledge of the presence of God. In ancient England, before the gospel came, the people used to think that life was a trip from darkness, a journey from darkness to darkness. They had halls in their villages with no glass or wood in the windows, but a fire in the middle of the room to keep them warm. And at night, birds would fly in through one side of the hall into the light of the fire and out through the other, back into the darkness. That was how they saw life, a quick flicker of light between darkness. Without God and without hope, our lives are like that. We go briefly from darkness to light, but then back to darkness. But this building says, remember, you are not what you were. All has changed. Now there is, for all who are rescued by Christ, as we may be, hope and light forever. Death is no end but the beginning of life without tears and without fears, surrounded by love, full of joy, with no rivalries and failures, but only future and celebration. The building says, remember, you are not who you were. I wonder if there are any Liverpool supporters here. I'm sure there'll be some Manchester United supporters. But I'm so pleased to see the choir wears red, the color of Liverpool. Maybe it's not the reason. When someone changes teams in the English Premiership, they move to a new club. They get new shirts, new colors. They'll probably play in a different style. And perhaps quite soon, they find themselves playing again against their old club. But everything has changed, and so must their game. They play, they play in a new way, for they have been changed. Paul is saying to the Ephesians that God has created a new nation, that all Christians have dual nationality. They are Kenyan or British or French or American or whatever, but first they are Christians and must live like Christians. To do that, they need to remember that God has changed them. They cannot be the same. Throughout Ephesians, Paul reminds us to be filled with the Spirit. For the Spirit reminds us that we belong to Christ and we must live in the new way. When I sin, it is the Spirit who says to me, no, you can't live like that. It does matter. You must repent. You must say sorry. You must turn back to God. We cannot divide up our lives as so many of us do and put them in different compartments, not watertight compartments, but spirit-tight compartments. We can't say, this is how I live at home with, my, with the family. I command and I bully. I am unfaithful and cruel. This different way is how I live at church. I am well-dressed and polite. I'm kind, and I do my best to look very, very Christian. This is how I live at work. I take advantage. I take money and steal. I bribe or I am bribed. I go out and get drunk with my colleagues. I plot and scheme to get ahead. And I betray in order to push down my competitors. 
This is how I am with my friends. I tell stories and gossip. I try to make myself look important. Too many people live like that. It's how the Ephesians were often behaving, if you go on reading through the latter. For they were people like us. But Paul says, remember, you've been changed. And you've been brought near to God. To be changed by Christ is never invisible. It always shows. If Christ has got hold of a human being, they are different. Is it a reasonable thing to say you can be filled with the Spirit of God and nobody notices? The night I finally, kicking and screaming, struggling, gave my life to Jesus, a year after I came back from Kenya to England, in a room in Cambridge on October the 12th, 1975, I was very worried what my friends would think. He's become part of the God Squad, they'd say. So I said to the person who led me to Christ, please don't tell anyone that I have become a Christian. Big mistake. I left the room a little after midnight and bumped into one of my friends. We spoke for 15 seconds or so about nothing in particular, and he suddenly said, for no reason at all, have you just become a Christian? <laughs> How did he know? I've no idea. But God ensured that I told him. After all, I could not deny it. He saw something. It is impossible to imagine that we can meet Christ, find forgiveness and eternal life, be filled with the Spirit of God and not be changed. It's ridiculous even to think it. But quickly, the world around us pressures us to conform back to what we were, to forget our dual nationality, to live only as citizens of this world. And so often, the Christians look just as they used to before they were changed. I am told that at one point, the Anglican Church of Kenya, the ACK, was called the Church of the Province of Kenya. And because the Archbishop at the time and the Provost spoke so often about social justice, about freedom or corruption, it became known as the Church of the Politics of Kenya. That was not because it was a political party, but because the church cared for the nation and that it should live as God wanted in righteousness. The name was intended for insult, but was a title of honor. I am often accused of being political in England. When I speak of injustice and inequality, I'm told to stick to religion. God forbid. For if we feed the hungry, we're doing right. But we must also ask why the economy permits hunger. In Nehemiah 8, when Ezra read the law, the people celebrated that they had rebuilt the walls of Jerusalem. And they celebrated being together and hearing the word of God. And they took gifts to those who had no food for the feast. To misquote something said many years ago by a Roman Catholic archbishop in South America, when we feed the hungry, people say that we are good. But when we say that there should not be hunger for some and riches for others, we're told we're being political. If God has changed us and made us a new people, we will be changed and that will affect everything we say and do. This cathedral in its hundred years has seen the church be faithful to God and it says, remember, you have been made citizens of heaven. Live with the new lives you've been given. And it says that to the church for it is the seat of the Archbishop. 
Deuteronomy says, do not forget. Ephesians says, you'll n- remember, you're not what you were. And Matthew looks to the future in Jesus' words and says to us, you must live to change the world with the gospel and with love as salt and light. It's the third thing that the cathedral calls us to remember. We belong to God. He walks with us. We are a new people. We must be different. We have a mission to be salt and light so that God may be glorified. Salt gives flavor and it preserves. It keeps things from going rotten. Light reveals truth. Sunlight is a powerful disinfectant. When I was a very small child living in a flat in London with my father, I was very frightened of the dark. That may not happen to Kenyan children. Certainly, Your Grace the Archbishop, not to Maasai children. (laughs) One night, I must have been three or four years old, but it's one of my early memories. I woke up and saw a dark shape in the middle of the room. We'd been to the zoo in London that day, and being three or four, and with a strong imagination, I was sure it was a lion. (laughs) I'm not quite sure how a lion could or would want to get into a first floor flat in central London, but we all know that small children do not always think sensibly. I eventually moved my hand ever so slowly to the light switch and turned it on. And there in the middle of the room was a chair with my clothes on it. (laughs) Light reveals truth. Where I spent much of my youth was on the coast of England with my grandmother. The coast where we lived was dangerous for ships and had been like that for hundreds of years. The church in the village was 600 years old and had two towers, one at each end. At the western end, the tower had a light in it and sailors knew that when they saw the light, they should keep far from the dangerous sandbanks on the coast. Light reveals truth, but it also reveals danger and trouble. And when we look around this cathedral, this wonderful cathedral, in some of the windows, we see stained glass, beautiful glass. At night, the colors are invisible. But when the sun shines through, then the glory of the windows is revealed. Light reveals God. A church that is light will reveal truths. It will show the truth around us in society. It will show up the dangers in society, and it will show and point to the glory of God. The church is also out in society, in the world. It only needs a few Christians to make a difference in places where there is wrongdoing, for there to be change and preservation. They are salt when they stop things going wrong by their witness and their courage. In England, at Lambeth Palace, where I live, we have a community of young people who live with us, about 15 of them. They're between 21 and 34 years old. They live with us for 10 months at a time, with a new group coming each September. It's called the Community of St. Anselm. They're from all over the world, different churches. They're very intelligent. They spend the time that they're with us learning to pray, studying how to live through the scriptures, in service to the poor, and living in community. One of those from the first year that we did this may be here today. And we have a Kenyan as well this year. They are wonderful young people. The aim is that whatever they do in their lives in the future, after they leave, they will have learned to be salt and light. For to be salt and light takes time and discipline. Jesus is saying that Christian discipleship is not part of our lives, 
but it is all of our lives. And the cathedral, just standing here, reminds us, remember to learn to be disciples so that you may change the world. And to put that into action, this cathedral has plans for training through its wonderful vision for extending its work for children and young people. In so doing, it will be creating a group of people who aim to live as Christians all their lives, changing their country and the world. But what does a nation look like where the people of God, the disciples of Christ, are truly salt and light? At its heart will be a capacity for reconciliation. I am choosing my words very carefully. Reconciliation is not mediation or arbitration or trickery and abandoning principle. It is the transformation of violent and destructive conflict into lives in which disagreement is still there but is dealt with peacefully for the common good. Reconciliation is supremely the gift of God through Jesus, for he alone reconciles us to God. It is the call of the church to be a reconciled people who love one another, even when we differ, for that is the miracle of Pentecost. Reconciliation is given by Jesus to Christians and to the church in so much abundance that when they are genuinely salt and light, it overflows massively into society and transform the world. A Christian people will be reconciled reconcilers. They will deal well with disagreement. They will know how to forgive, how to stand for truth, and not to hate or fight, how to rule or to oppose, and how to make a nation whole and healed. Reconciliation, tragically, is profoundly rare. It is unknown in most countries, and even in the church. But it is the call and prayer of Christ, in John 17 especially. Paul, in his second letter to the Corinthians, says, be reconciled to God in chapter 5, and in so doing become ambassadors of reconciliation. Reconciliation is so costly it is a cost that we see in the death of Jesus on the cross. That is the measure of the cost of reconciliation. It means putting ourselves as less important than the common good. It means suffering so that others may flourish. Perhaps its high cost is why it is so rare in societies and we prefer conflict. And I say we carefully. A major and very serious British magazine in an article published the day before yesterday spoke, wrote powerfully about our growing incapacity in this world to deal well with difference. An incapacity made worse by social media, by the effects of information, by the impact of the words that are written and sent around the world. The magazine said this, I quote, in 1962, a British political scientist, Bernard Crick, published a book in defense of politics. He argued that without decent civility and conciliation, societies resolve their differences by resorting to coercion. In so many countries, including my own, including this one, there is a need for reconciliation. It must become part of our DNA, part of Kenya's DNA. I'm not talking about results and outcomes of elections. That would be interference by me as an ignorant outsider. But I'm talking about how disagreements are dealt with, because that is the call of the pastor 
as has been shown by the churches and many, many others in this land. I'm not calling for mediation, but for the steady and long-term work of building structures of reconciliation, the capacity to deal with the nation's challenges in a way that brings peace and a future, even when there is deep disagreement. Since independence, Kenya has been a model for Africa, without coup d'etat, without civil war, yes, with problems and trials, but for the most part, keeping the peace. You know, in our world today, we need an example of reconciliation. Not only in this country, but in the region of which it is the leader, in the continent, around the world. This land is the cradle of human beings. Human life started here. You have the gospel and you've shown us how to live it. Your churches are vigorous and full. You live in harmony between faiths. Can you not show us how to be a country of reconciliation that we may learn? There is a deep hunger around the world for an example of great differences handled well. With your great heritage, your immense courage, your history of faith, symbolized for Christians here among other places, be that unusual country that rises to the call of God to be overflowing with reconciliation. Yes, the cost is great, but the rewards are the flourishing and future of the generation, of the nation. So this key cathedral says, remember. Remember your history, that God has walked with you. You've never been on your own. We have never been on our own. But God has loved and accompanied us. He shows his will and law so we know what holiness is. Remember that we've been changed. If we belong to Christ, we can no longer live as we used to, says Paul to the Ephesians and to us. Remember, says Jesus, that you are salt and light and that you must not lose your flavor of salt or your illumination as light. In salty faithfulness to Christ, you preserve the nation as bright lights shine out to bring hope, reveal danger, glorify God. In the year of the centenary, looking to the past, preserving the present building for the future, the cathedral witnesses in stone and glass to the call of God. Do not forget, you are not what you were. And in Christ, you live to change the world. Amen. May we all rise. And we stand together with Christians throughout the centuries and throughout the world today to affirm our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate of the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake he was crucified and a Pontius Pilate. He suffered, died, and was buried. On the third day he rose again. In accordance with the scriptures, he ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. 
he will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated. We continue with prayers for the church and those who serve the church and for all people who preach and practice the gospel of Christ, for all those who sacrifice so that we get the gospel, Lord, in your mercy. For those who heard the word of God here in Kenya and passed it on to us, and for their continued growth in the love of God's name and in faithfulness to the covenant, Lord, in your mercy. For our beloved country, Kenya, for the president, and for all who serve in our government, for the people of Kenya in all places and at all times, Lord, hear our prayer. For the poor, the homeless, the unemployed, and for those who suffer under persecution, for those who hunger for the justice, Lord, in your mercy, for the church in Kenya, for our church leaders, Archbishop Jackson, bishops, clergy, and all people under their charge, Lord, in your mercy. Let us pray for the Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin, for the wise words he has given us this morning, that God, Heavenly Father, give of every good gift. We thank you for blessing us with Justin, our Archbishop. Pour your Holy Spirit upon him and sanctify him as your ardent servant, consecrated in holiness. Mold him unto true likeness of your son to be a compassionate shepherd to your people. Keep him steadfast in times of trial, ever faithful in obeying your will, and zealous in proclaiming Christ to the world. May your divine wisdom guide his every decision and your strength sustain him in his apostolic ministry. We ask this through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns for you, and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Let us pray for His Excellency, the President-elect and the Deputy President-elect of Kenya. Almighty God, we pray for our President-elect, His Excellency Uhuru Kenyatta, the Deputy President-elect, the Cabinet Ministers and all those who hold leadership positions in our country. Grant our President great wisdom as he leads this nation at a time when we are faced with so many challenges that threaten our unity as a nation. Guide him in your righteousness so that we may be governed in ways that promote peace, justice, national unity, and the well-being of all Kenyans. We ask this through Jesus Christ, who is the Prince of Peace. Amen. Today is uh, an international service. We want to pray special prayers for Her Majesty the Queen and the heads of states of all countries represented here by people who have come to join us. Almighty God, who has set Queen Elizabeth upon the throne of her realm and given her grace to rule all those years, receive our heartfelt thanks for this, her service to her people, to the Commonwealth, and to the world confirm and encourage her in the countenance of the same and keep her in the heavenly wisdom through Jesus Christ our Lord who took the form of a servant for our sake 
and reign now in glory with thee and the Holy Spirit, one God, world without end. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, all times are your seasons, and all occasions invite your tender mercies. Accept your prayers, accept our prayers and intercessions offered in this place today and in the days to come through Jesus Christ, our mediator and advocate. Amen. And now, brethren, hear the words of challenge and comfort our Savior Christ says to all who follow him. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. To me, all of you who are tired of carrying your heavy loads, and I will give you rest. So all of you who repent of your sins, who love your neighbors and intend to lead a new life following the way of Jesus, come with faith and take this holy sacrament to strengthen you. But first, let us together reverently confess our sins to the Almighty God. Almighty God, creator of all, you marvelously made us in your image, but we have corrupted ourselves and damaged your likeness by rejecting your love and hurting our neighbors. We have done wrong and neglected to do right. We are sincerely sorry and had to repent of our sins. Remake us in the sacrifice of your son. Almighty God, whose steadfast love is as great as the heavens are high above the earth, remove your sins from you as far as the east is from the west. Strengthen your life in his kingdom and keep you upright to the last day through Jesus Christ, our merciful high priest. Amen. Thank you for forgiveness. We come to your table as your children, not presuming but assured, not trusting ourselves but your word. We hunger and thirst for righteousness and ask for our hearts to be satisfied with the body and the blood of your Son, Jesus Christ the righteous. Amen. Lord Jesus Christ, you said to your apostles, I leave you peace, my peace I give you. Look not on your sins, but on the faith of your church and grant us the peace and unity of your kingdom, where you live forever and ever. Amen. Let us all stand so that we can share the peace together. Make sure you shake somebody's hand and share the peace of God with that person. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Let us offer one another a sign of peace. We thank you all for honoring our invitations and for attending this auspicious occasion when we celebrate 100 years of God's faithfulness. Please be seated and St. Nicholas Children Home will make a special presentation. I will sing, I will shout hallelujah, I will sing. 
all protocol observed. Before you is Saint Nicholas, a children's home, ready to sing one song, entitled On the Judgment. Thank you very much, St. Nicholas Children Home. Let's once again appreciate them as they sit. Your graces and your excellency, these are children in our children home that we as the Anglican Church support in their schooling and we provide shelter for them to give them a future. So thank you very much. We want to have a moment to give our friends. Today we will do a special offering for the cathedral members. You are free to give your tithes and your offerings. We have a big project that is coming up, which is the project for the Children and Teen Center. And we'll say more about the project later. But I'm very pleased this morning, your graces, when I had his own, uh, the, His Excellency saying he came for Sunday school here, and also Her Excellency the First Lady saying she came for Sunday school and, and, and nursery here. 
the center. Your Excellencies, the center now is too small. We need to build a big center for the children. Cathedral has about 1,200 children every Sunday and about 800 ch uh, teenagers. And that's why the big project that will come on the left of this cathedral will now be bequeathed to our children. And so our giving this morning is special. Let us be generous. And I'll ask Reverend Josephine to bless it before we give. Let us pray. Almighty God, we want to thank you so much for the many blessings that you've blessed us with. And so, loving Father, as we prepare ourselves to worship you with our gifts, we pray that you will teach us to give ourselves first, even before giving our gifts. And we pray that you receive them and bless them and bless the work of our hands. And even as we give, we pray that you'll remember each one of us and that you'll come through for us in a special way. And Father, we pray that this offertory will be used to extend your kingdom for the glory and honor of your name. For it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The giving will be given while people are seated for the flow uh, of the floor.
All things come from you, O Lord. Receive this offering that we have given with love, and we pray that our lives will be a sacrifice that honors your name every day. We bless it in the name of God the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Please be upstanding. The choir will sing as we receive the elements. Page 28 of our prayer book. We remain standing for thanksgiving and remembrance. Is the Father with us? Yes. Is Christ among us? Yes. Is the Spirit here? Yes. This is our God. Our we are his people. We are Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and our delight to give you thanks and praise, great Father, living God, supreme over the world, creator, provider, savior, and giver. From a wandering Norman, you created your family. For a burdened people, you raised up a leader. For a confused nation, you chose a king. For a rebellious crowd, you sent your prophets. In these last days, you have sent your son, your perfect image bringing in your kingdom revealing your will, rising, reigning, remaking your people for yourself. 
Through him, you have poured out your Holy Spirit, filling us with light and life. Amen. Therefore, with angels, archangels, faithful ancestors, and all in heaven, we proclaim your great and glorious name, forever praising you and saying, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna. Almighty God, honor of all things, we thank you for giving up your son to die on the cross for us who owe you everything. Pour your refreshing spirit on us as we remember him in the way he commanded through these gifts of your creation. On the same night he was betrayed, he took bread and gave you thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, take it, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and gave you thanks. He gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. We are brothers and sisters through his blood. We have died together. We will rise together. We will live together. Therefore heavenly, therefore, heavenly Father, hear us as we celebrate this covenant with joy and await the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. He died in our place, making a full atonement of the sin of the whole world, the perfect sacrifice once and for all. You accepted his offering by raising him in, from the dead and granting him great honor at your right hand on high. Amen. Jesus is Lord. This is the feast of victory. The Lamb was reigned as we can say, Amen. As our Savior taught us, so we are bold to pray. Let us sit or kneel to pray. The Lord's Prayer. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. Though we are many, we are one body, for we all share one bread. The cup of blessings which we bless is a sharing in the blood of Christ. Draw near with faith and receive. Christ is the host and we are his guests. Christ is alive forever. We are because he is.
We turn to page 36. Let us all observe a moment of silence, reflecting on God's faithfulness to us for a hundred years, to reflect on his salvation. And let us now together pray that prayer. O God of our ancestors, God of our people, before whose face the human generations pass away, we thank you that in you we are kept safe forever, and that the broken fragments of our history are gathered up in the redeeming act of your dear Son, remembered in this holy sacrament and bread and wine. Help us to walk daily in communion of saints, declaring our faith in the forgiveness of sins and the resurrection of the body. Now send us out in the power of your Holy Spirit that we may work for your praise and glory. Amen. At this point, a number of things will happen as we bring the service to an end. The first one will be the notices. And the second one, I'll be inviting His Grace, the Archbishop, to recognize our distinguished guests here present. After that, we will have the dedication of the history book, and then the strategic plan, and lastly, it will be the Children and Teens Center uh, project. And after that, we would like to present the centenary history book to our guests. And now allow me, Your Grace and Your Excellencies, to make a few announcements. Number one, as it is prescribed in our service, page 42, we publish the bands of marriage between the persons listed in our service sheet for the first, for the second, and for the third times, respectively. If you know any just cause or impediment why these persons should not be joined together in holy matrimony, you're required to declare that to us. Other announcements, today we have a number of merchandise to commemorate a hundred years. On my left, as you exit through Uhuru Park, there are tents that are there. There is a Mother's Union tent where you can get materials and other uh, things that go with the Mother's Union. We will also see another tent where you can get the centenary uh, merchandise such as the cufflinks for men, the lapel pins for both men and women, a shopping bag. In the same, same desk, you will be able to get the history book, which is on sale. Please make sure you carry it today. Today, we have the hard copy edition, and next week, you will have the soft copy edition. So if you'd like the hard copy, please go to the tent on to my left and you'll be able to get that. I'll be able to tell you the prizes shortly, but allow me now to bring His Grace, the Archbishop of Kenya, to recognize our distinguished guests. Your Grace. I want to take this opportunity now to greet all of us formally in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Good afternoon. Or is it morning? I think it's still not yet fully afternoon. Uh, I want to uh, welcome all of us who have come to worship with us. And His Grace, the Archbishop of Canterbury has said the cathedral is a place of remembrance and we have all come to remember how united we are as a people, as a nation, and we are all gathered today to worship God in this, our cathedral. 
I want to recognize uh, the following people who have come to be with us uh, today as we celebrate 100 years. We have the most reverend the right uh, Honorable Lord Archbishop of Canterbury, who was our preacher. Uh, I think we don't need to tell him to stand again because he stood to preach to us. But we also have his chaplain, Bishop Anthony Pogo, who works with him. Maybe he can just stand and wave. We also have with us His Excellency, the President-elect and the First Lady of the Republic of Kenya, His Excellency Uhuru Muigai Kenyatta with us. Your Excellency, welcome. Uh, we also have His Excellency Mr. Nicholas J. Haley, the High Commission for uh, uh, British High Commission in Kenya. I think he's in our midst. We also have Ms. Canon William Beasley from the United States, Chicago. We also have uh, Ms. Chris Trott, I think, with us. Yes, thank you so much. We have the Reverend Matt Woodley with us from Chicago as well. We have Honorable David Maraga with us, our Chief Justice. We have Justice Karioki Kihara with us. We have Lieutenant General Robert Kibochi representing our, uh, uh, representing our Kenya Defense Forces. We have my predecessor, Archbishop Eliud Wabukala, with us. And Mama Roda. We also have Archbishop Benjamin Zimbi, who was before for him, and Mama Zimbi. We have uh, Reverend David Holloway from Newcastle in England. We have a bishop representing the Archbishop of Nigeria, the Right Reverend David Onoha. We also have the Right Reverend Paul Kipto Masaba representing the Archbishop of Uganda. We have the retired Right Reverend Robert Martin, who was our Bishop of Marsabit, but now gone to, uh, to retire in the UK. Uh, I'm also informed that uh, the former Prime Minister, Right Honorable Raila Odinga, is with us. We also have uh, CS Amina Mohammed with us. We have a representative of the Orthodox Church with us. We have the head of the Methodist Church, presiding Bishop Ndombura with us. We have our own who have been nominated to the Senate, the Reverend Canon Naomi Wako, who is now Senator Wako. And I want all our canons to stand because there are many just to wave, both clerical and lay canons of the cathedral and the diocese. We have the assistant clergy of All Saints Cathedral Diocese. Please uh, stand wherever you are and wave.
We have the Reverend Jane Mwangi representing Bishop Mount Kenya Central. And now we have many bishops from our Anglican Church serving various dioceses. I will ask them to stand and I will mention their dioceses. Uh, from that corner, we have uh, the Bishop of Kitale, Right Reverend Stephen Kewasis. In the front row, we have Bishop Simon Oketch, Bishop of uh, Maseno North. Bishop of Nairobi, Bishop Joel Wawero. Bishop of Machakos, Bishop Joseph Mutungi. Bishop of Kapsabet, uh, Bishop Paul Korir. That one served in this cathedral as assistant provost. <laughs> so he's known to many. We also have uh, our South African Bishop, Kleti. We have the Bishop of Kericho, who replaced me in Kericho, the Red Reverend Arnes Ngeno. We have the Bishop of Butere, Tim Wambunya, Doctor. We have the Bishop of Marsabit, Bishop Kampicha from Marsabit. We have the Bishop of Muranga South, Bishop uh, Karano. We have the Bishop of Malindi, Bishop uh, Lawrence Dena. We also have the Bishop of Marlal, Bishop Jacob Lesuda. And we have the Bishop of Thika, Bishop uh, Julius. He, he was a provost here. <laughs> we also have the General Secretary of AACC with us, <laughs> Dr. Karamanga. We have Andrew, oh, oh, is that the, we also have uh, Reverend Dr. Dennis Tongoi, CMS Africa. <laughs> we also have uh, Canon Peter Karanja the, of NCCK. He was also a former provost. So you can hear the ululation of those who have a history here. We also have our former provost who are retired bishops, Bishop uh, uh, Peter Njenga. We also have our former provost who served for a long time, Peter Njoka, who also became the bishop of uh, 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 Nairobi. I've already said we have the presiding bishop of the Methodist Church, Re Right Reverend Joseph Ndombura of Methodist Church. We also have Matthew Mwalua with us, Senior Pastor AIC Mlimani. We also have Simon Mburu, Senior Associate Pastor Parklands Baptist Church. I also want to introduce in a special way my provincial secretary who has been out in the US and she has been awarded a PhD, now the Reverend Doctor. Canon Rosemary Mbogo. We uh, want to thank God for all of us who are present here. We have our heads of our institution, uh, our Usima Publishing House, Clement Ouko. We also have Wilbur Foswangalwa. We have Desmond Mutula and our Chancellor, Tom Onyango. We want to thank all of you who have made it to this glorious and great occasion where we are all gathered to celebrate. Bishop, I'm retired. Now, we have bishops who have retired. They have served this church. Sorry they didn't stand when I introduced the bishops of dioceses. 
but I want to recognize the retired Bishop of the Diocese of Kajiado, Jeremiah Tama. We also have a retired Bishop Isaac Nanga of Mount Kenya Central. We also have the representative of Nairobi County Speaker with us. So I want to take this opportunity to thank all of you for this moment that God has given us to come and share and celebrate God's faithfulness. We have been reminded by our preacher today that the ministry of the church is the ministry of reconciliation. We have also been reminded that this cathedral is a cathedral of remembrance, and we have gathered here as this national cathedral, as a national church, but also with the leadership of this nation. We need to be reminded that Kenya is one nation, not many nations. We also need to remember that we have said in our constitution, we, the people of Kenya, not people of different regions. We are one country, one nation. This cathedral is an emblem of our unity in our nation, spiritually giving guidance, and we will continue to do so. The church is for the greater good of society. We need to champion that greater good. Things to build us up, to make us strong, not to make us weak. Our economy belongs to all of us in this country. Let us build it, not destroy it, for it will affect each one of us. If we all become lovers of this nation, for us and posterity, let us remember the remembrance of this cathedral is the unity of this nation. Even as we say that, let us also remember that mercy is what we come to receive here. The love of God and his mercies are the things we come to receive here. May God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Your Grace. It is now my honor and pleasure to welcome Professor Gilbert E.M. Ogutu, the consultant who worked very hard the whole of this year to bring us our history book. He will make a few remarks. After that, Mr. K Karanja Kahia, the chairman of the celebration 2017, will present the book to you, Your Grace, for dedication. Your Excellency, the President-elect. Your Excellency, the High British High Commissioner. When this service ends, send our greetings to our Queen, because <laughs> she became Queen in Kenya. So she's our Queen, alone to Britain. Your Graces. Archbishop of Canterbury, bishops, our own Archbishop, bishops, and other senior people. If I were to do the right thing, I would have taken you through the book, but we agreed with my dear brother and friend, the provost, that I don't do that. I only make a few remarks and I'm going to make it as brief as we agreed. Our long journey of faith has been both spiritual and academic voyage of discovery. We sought to discover events, people, and circumstances that marked the realization of the call to go ye into the world, make disciples, teach them. The call, the command, came from none other than the man Jesus of Nazareth, the Messiah who came. This remains compelling because all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. If we claim 
to have no sin, we deceive ourselves. On the 23rd September 1959, at around 8.30 p.m. at the CMS Maseno School, I received the Lord Jesus as my personal savior. I joined the revival Balokole to Kutenres movement. From then on, I have no apology to make to anybody for loving my Lord and Savior. Amen. Meanwhile, on the 23rd April 1942, William Temple, a graduate fellow of Balliol College, Oxford, was enthroned the 98th Archbishop of Canterbury. Our chief guest, Archbishop of Canterbury, who has just preached to us, a graduate of Trinity College, Cambridge, and expert on the history and politics of Kenya and Nigeria, was appointed and became the 105th Archbishop of Canterbury some 71 years after Temple. And we have a reason for citing that. In September 1977, I got a rare coveted privilege of being admitted to the prestigious Faculty of Theology at Oxford University for my doctoral studies. Professor Dr. Canon Peter Hinchliffe of Balliol College, Oxford, was my director of studies or supervisor. My field of study was ecclesiastical or church history, researching on the history of the Catholic Mill Hill Mission to Uganda and Kenya. And Your Excellency, this might interest you being a Catholic yourself. <laughs> the pleasant coincidence is that in 1978, when our guest earned himself a master's degree, an excellent thesis he wrote at Trinity College, Cambridge. The coincidence is that in that same year, I also attended contemporary African history lectures under Professor John Lonsdale at Trinity College, Cambridge. We never met there. We have met here, and we are going to meet more. Just a word, a small word, on All Saints Day, which has not been touched on. On All Saints Day, we meditate on the lives of the righteous whose souls are in the hands of God. We look back down the long range of history, and we think of the patriarchs and prophets and lawgivers and psalmists of the Old Testament. We think of the master's friends, of his chosen apostles and many disciples, of holy women who ministered unto him. We think of the early Christian martyrs. We commemorate all heroic missionaries. We commemorate glorious philanthropists who gave so freely that our sanctuary may be built. We commemorate myriads of good men and women who, unknown to the world, have lived faithfully the hidden life, and who live in unvisited tombs. Me, my family, and this treasure, the book. Soon after I was interviewed and selected for this project, I fell sick and was at high dependency unit at Agakan Hospital for 18 days, to be followed by 79 days at a private ward being nursed, bathed, and fed like a baby. And at this point, I want, in a second, just to thank my children. Can you stand? I have there my pretty daughter. Yeah, I'm almost coming to an end. During that trying moment, what bothered me most was this project. Thank God the book is finally here. Now, my beloved, be my Theophilus. You are going to read that in the book, 
and you are going to come to us. Challenge, and we come to an end. I have only another half a second. <laughs> to the Centenary Committee, thank you for giving me the opportunity and privilege to document this amazing story. I now understand my Anglican church and my cathedral better and ready to heed the message, write down the revelation and make it plain on tablets so that a herald messenger may run with it. And now, to the church and the cathedral leadership, remember and carefully ponder Samuel set up a stone and named the place Ebenezer, meaning this far he has helped us. And also don't forget, no one who puts his hand on the plow and looks back is fit for the service in the kingdom of God. Finally, never forget the fact that Isaac asked his father, where is the lamb? And Abraham answered, God will provide. We owe the little ones and the elderly their version of this story. We owe the Christian church, the Anglican communion, the Anglican Church of Kenya this story up to today with projections into the future. That is All Saints Cathedral or the church in 2017. Finally, to this great, loving, lovable congregation of All Saints Cathedral Church, because I'm madly in love with every one of you, I feel tempted to share with you the secret that has kept me going in my Christ-guided life. Who has touched me? I feel energy has left me. Lord, it is me who reached out and touched you and was instantly healed. My daughter, go in peace. Your faith has healed you. Reach out and touch the Lord as he walks by. Reach out and touch the Lord as he walks by. He will answer every prayer. He will answer every prayer. You are needs to supply. Reach out and touch the Lord as he walks by. Your Grace, the Archbishop of Kenya, on behalf of our forefathers who bequeathed us this cathedral, the generations of Christians who have worshipped here before us since 1917, the Anglican faith force in this province to whom this is their national cathedral, all persons to whom this sanctuary has provided refuge, the current congregation of this cathedral, the provost, clergy, and staff, the church council, all cathedral ministries that have made worship in this sanctuary memorable, and finally, on behalf of members of the Centenary Celebrations Committee, and specifically the History Committee, it is now my pleasure and honor to present this history book to you to consecrate 
for posterity. Almighty God, we thank you for those who work diligently in the producing of this book and pray that we, as we read this book, it will always be a constant reminder to us to take care and watch ourselves closely as, so as neither to forget the things that our eyes have seen or not let them slip from our minds all the days of our lives, and that we shall make them known to our children and our children's children. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And now we dedicate and launch All Saints Cathedral Centenary Book in the name of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, Your Grace. Let me ask the parish council to come as I say very few words as I present the strategic plan to you for the launch as well. This is the third strategic plan of the cathedral. It is 2017-2021, and it draws the roadmap to us attaining a better cathedral in the next 100 years. After the reveal survey, we have changed our vision we have also changed our cathedral mission statement. We have relooked at the core values, and we feel the cathedral will be a better place. The vision now for the cathedral is a Christ-centered cathedral. The mission statement of the cathedral is to transform people's lives through the Word of God. The following are our values. Scripture, we acknowledge the authority of the Scripture as the true Word of God. Number two, prayer. We are committed to individual and corporate prayers. Thirdly, discipleship. We are disciples of Christ and we are committed to making disciples. Fourthly, diversity. We recognize and seek to harness our diversity to strengthen the ministry in the cathedral. Faith, we uphold high standard of excellence in our ministry, work, and service delivery. And lastly is innovation. We seek to stir up the gifts and the talents in our Christians for effective ministry. Your grace on behalf of the congregation, we as the parish council now present to you the next strategic plan 2017-2021. Now we receive this plan with gladness, and before we launch it, let us pray that the Lord will use this plan 
for us to be able to accomplish his mission and ministry. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for giving us this moment to celebrate you. As we celebrate 100 years of faithful Christian ministry in this cathedral, now we want now to commit ourselves before you as we look into the distant future and begin to imagine that future. Your word reminds us that men plan, but it is you who order the steps and make those plans a reality. So, Lord, this plan undertaken and carried out by the PCC members of this cathedral is now ready for implementation. We invite you that in every undertaking of the activities planned here, your holy presence will forever be with those who will be implementing, and we shall be able to realize the results envisaged in this plan. And so, God, we want to dedicate this plan in your name for the greater good of your church, for the edification of your church and the growth of this cathedral, in the name of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And we now officially launch the commencement of this five-year strategic plan, 2017 to 2021, in the name of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, Your Grace. Finally now, allow me, Your Excellencies and Your Graces, to invite Canon John Wairumbe, who is the chair of the Cathedral Centenary, the Cathedral uh, Teens and Children's Centre, to come for a brief comment and a fly through. Your Excellency, Your Graces, all our guests, brothers and sisters in Christ, praise the Lord. As we celebrate 100 years of God's faithfulness, uh, we cannot also afford to end the day without mentioning about the future. And the future of this church and the future of the nation, we know it is in our children. And it is for this reason that as we celebrate the past, we also want to say the future. As we say the future, we are focusing on discipline and reaching out to the next generation. Specifically, the children, teenagers, and also people with disabilities, particularly the deaf, in order to equip them spiritually for them to be firm in their faith and to, uh, and to be Christ ambassadors to the future generation. This is why the flagship project of the new century, as envisioned in the Cathedral Strategic Plan 2017-2021, is the provision of facilities for the growing numbers of these three special groups of our congregation. Currently, we have 1,200 children, 800 teenagers, and 70 deaf congregants worshiping at the cathedral every Sunday. These numbers have stretched our current facilities to a breaking point. In addition, there is need to modernize the facilities to be in tune with the current realities. It is for that reason that the Children and Teen Center will provide classrooms, chapels, recreational areas, resource centers, cafeterias, and office facilities to accommodate children, teens, and the deaf with provision for growth in the facilities. On 1st November 2017, which is Austin's day, his Grace, the Archbishop Most Reverend Dr. Jackson, uh, Jackson Olesapit, laid the foundation stone, and we expect the CTC project to be completed within four and a half years. It is indeed a financially heavy project 
with an estimated cost of approximately 1 billion Kenya shillings, and this calls for us as individuals to commit with our talents, financial resources, and also uh, to join hands to be the today's Nehemiahs. As I quote Apostle Paul in his letter to Romans in chapter 10, verse 14, he said, how then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? It is for this reason, your excellency and uh, your graces and all our guests, that uh, we are inviting each one of us to join hands with us to see how much this cathedral has served this nation when we see the quality of people who have gone through our facilities at the cathedral, either as a Sunday school class or as a kindergarten, where I'm excited to hear that Your Excellency and Her Excellency, you are also part of those people that have gone through these facilities. One of our strategies, Your Excellency, in raising funds, it is to look for alumni of Austin's Cathedral. With your permission, we shall request that you can also be in that list to confirm that this cathedral has ministered to people who can be in positions of authority and responsibility. I now invite you to accompany me on a very short tour of the facilities to be provided in the CTC as, we will be, as, as they will be projected in the screens. You're not going to walk out from where you are, but through the screens, I'm going to request that you join me in a very short tour so that uh, you can see. Located along uh, Kenyatta Avenue, opposite Serena Hotel in Nairobi, is the historic All Saints Cathedral, the heart of the Anglican Church in Kenya. It has grown in resilience over the years, and in 2017, the cathedral celebrates its 100th year of spiritual nourishment in the city. Due to the rising demand of space for spiritual provisions indicated by the congestion in current children and teen sanctuaries, the cathedral wishes to present to you the Children and Teen Center, which will add a new look to the entire cathedral. The new building welcomes you with the office block right past the main sanctuary. It flows to unveil a surprise for our children and a present to our teens by offering outdoor interactive greenery with ornamental trees, planters with seats, and a detailed amphitheater for casual children activities. They all form a well-organized courtyard which gives life to the building. The internal spaces of this massive building meet your every expectation. It has a creche and toddler's rooms designed to offer comfort to young mothers and celebrate the playful nature of children. The design captures children's joy and spirituality and compiles all that into a comfy children's chapel with a capacity of 1,000 where they can connect with their creator. It provides state-of-the-art classrooms to children's taste and an identity that will have children own up the space. As you round this building, your urge to see more will have you surprised, not knowing what awaits in the teen's chapel. The attention to details and the clarity of human craft, adequate lighting and standard eye vision will automatically have 1,000 teens fellowship in togetherness. in the Arctic above the Teen's Chapel is equipped with modern facilities to give the deaf a sense of belonging. 
It is acoustically sound to avoid destruction to other services in the other building spaces. Other spaces in the building include a kitchen and its cafeteria, which overlook Uhuru Park, a basement park accessed from processional way, equipment stores and a media room. It has washrooms located in the central circulatory axis, which is installed with a lift, staircase and a ramp. The attic above the children's chapel will have meeting and team counselling rooms. The backside overlooking Gong Road has a children's play area behind the 36 classrooms exclusive for children. All these spaces will be enclosed in a building with Gothic architectural character, which gives the cathedral its identity and style. A dream which must be built. Your graces and your excellencies, that will be made possible by your generous contribution. The building will be on this hill up here, and we are hoping that at the be beginning of December, we will begin now the construction, but we pray that you may be generous to bequeath our children a better place like the cathedral. I must also thank Mr. Mwakazi, who is a member of this church, who generously gave his voice uh, to us at no cost. Please appreciate him. I would now like, as we come to the end of the service, to present a few copies to people who have contributed immensely to this cathedral. I would like now to invite Professor Gilbert E. Ogutu, the provost of the cathedral, myself, the former provosts, and the retired archbishops to join me here to receive your copy of the books. Children, quickly. Please. Ah, these are the youths. The youths will be the first ones to present to Professor Ogutu. Please appreciate him for the work he has done. <laughs> Let me invite my predecessors first before I receive the Bishop Peter Jenga is here, and I'll ask the youths, or whoever to come, the youths to come and present to Bishop Jenga a copy. These are people who labored in this cathedral and would like to appreciate them. The next one is Bishop Peter Njoka. Thank you very much, my lords and my predecessors, for your labor. We stand on your shoulders. The next is Reverend Canon Peter Karanja. The next one is my predecessor immediate, the Bishop uh, Wanyoike. <laughs> Canons, please come. Yeah, you present. Go ahead.
Allow me with humility to receive a copy, please. <laughs> Please, the retired archbishops, and we have two of them here present, uh, Your Grace uh, Benjamin Zimbi. The next is His Grace, uh, the Archbishop Eliud. Thank you. That's a leather bound. Thank you. Uh, please take your seats. Allow me to invite now the Archbishop of Kenya and the Archbishop of Canterbury to receive their copies, and His Grace the Archbishop of Canterbury to receive on behalf of Her Majesty the Queen. Your Grace the Archbishop of Kenya. Now it is His Grace, the Archbishop of Canterbury. Hello. Uh, without the children, I will have the honor to do it. With honor and humility, please receive uh, a copy and our letter to Her Majesty the Queen. Please have your seats, apart from the Archbishop of Kenya. It is now my honor to welcome my father in God, Archbishop Jackson, to come and invite Honorable, Right Honorable Raila Odinga to also receive a copy, and after that, His Excellency the President. Thank you. my honor, Your Excellency, to invite you to receive a copy of the book. Welcome, His Excellency the President, to greet the congregation. Your Excellency. Thank you. Your Grace the Archbishop of Canterbury, Your Grace the Archbishop of the Anglican Church here in Kenya, my Lord Bishops, the clergy, members of this great congregation. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. God is good. All the time. 
and all the time. Um, I wasn't ready to say anything, <laughs> but let me say that uh, indeed it is a great honor and as we come to the end of the service, I say a great pleasure to have joined you in today's celebration of a hundred years of this magnificent cathedral. Let me say, as Professor Ogutu said earlier, yes, indeed, I am a Catholic, but we are here today as a fellow Kenyan, a fellow Christian, and indeed to celebrate the great works of the Anglican Church in the Republic of Kenya. Let me also say that I was also quite surprised by the generosity of the Anglicans because as I was sitting there, you know, they came to offer and ask if we would like to take communion. And I was quite surprised because you know where I come from, we don't offer communion to strangers. <laughs> and I was actually quite willing to, to go up, but then I recognized that this event is live. And my, and my cardinal may be watching, and I wasn't sure how he would respond to that. But at least it shows the great generosity of the church. The Anglican Church and the history of Kenya are one and the same thing. From the creation of Kenya as a protectorate, to a colony, to our independence, we have moved together, shoulder to shoulder. Through all the trials and tribulations that our countries has had, the Anglican Church was there. In the critical days of the Second Liberation, the Anglican Church was there all the way to present time and the great contribution that this church has also made to health, to education, as much as spreading the word of God throughout our country and region, and also the peace work that has been done by the Anglican Church in the region, especially in neighboring South Sudan. These are all works that are very, very much appreciated. So it is indeed with pride that I join you as we celebrate these hundred years, and we look forward to working together with you. And Provost, uh, you can count me in as you uh, work towards building for the next hundred years. I am more than happy <laughs> to be part and parcel of this wonderful center that I see you are willing to kick off on. Na hiyo mambo ingine tutaongea kando. Kwa hivyo mimi nasema Mungu awabariki na muendelee kuombea taifa letu la Kenya. Asanteni sana. Your your excellency uh, there may still be uh, an impossibility of mutual communion between our churches, though we welcome you always, wherever you are in the world. Um, but given that I gave the Pope last Friday a gift and he didn't say no, I think I'm allowed to give that to you <laughs> without the Cardinal getting you into trouble. So, Your Excellency, with thanks and appreciation. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Let me also say that uh, I think we heard your message of reconciliation. And I hope that every single person in this room has also heard that message. Thank you very much. I'm so sorry, Your Excellency, I used your microphone. <laughs> In England, that would be called Les Majeste, and I would be confined to prison for many years. <laughs> your Grace, this is a very small gift, but it is a reminder that we share together the ministry of Christ. And my profound gratitude to you and admiration for you and ACK. Thank you. 
and provost. I was a dean once. It was the best job going, but I don't think I was nearly as good a dean as you are. A small gift for the cathedral. And this is a very small gift for you personally. And to say we pray for you, and I think, I hope, that from some of our funds, we will be able to give you a little support in this wonderful dream you have. Thank you. Your Grace, uh, we also have a small gift for you and your wife. <laughs> when you go back home, please, you'll remember Kenya. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Your Grace. This is wonderful. And my wife and I will argue over who gets the bag and who gets the box. <laughs> <laughs> but I am very, very grateful. Thank you. Thank you, it has been wonderful to be here. Thank you very much, Your Graces and Your Excellencies. Thank you for honoring us once again and for coming uh, to grace this occasion. We are indebted to you. We will knock at your doors to request that we bequeath our children this center as we have been bequeathed this cathedral. We now stand for the final blessing. Now we are going to send all our problems to where the Lord will sort each one of them. All our problems, we send to the cross of Christ. All our difficulties, we send to the cross of Christ. All the devil's work, we send to the cross of Christ. And all our hopes, we send to the Christ. And now, Christ, the Son of Righteousness, shine upon you and scatter darkness from before your path. And the blessings of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you always. Amen. the national anthem first, please.
into the world, rejoicing in the power of the Spirit. Thanks be to God. A small change in terms of him who first sing and the Nazi while we are here, then we sing Christian soldiers, onward Christian soldiers, as we recess.
if you're not accredited media, can you move away? Or if you're not media and you're secu not security, we need to create a space here for the bishops to get out. Only security and media. Only security and media. I want to exit the bishops here.